The History of Curriculum in America. So the beginning of our country, well, education wasn't that big of an issue because there weren't that many children to educate. Remember the New England colonies were organized by Puritans, meaning their primary focus in education wasn't to ensure that each individual was reaching their cognitive potential. The focus was on ensuring that the children could read and write enough to be able to engage in ongoing Bible study to avoid cultural decline in this new savage environment. Massachusetts was the first colony to put laws on the books regarding education, and Boston officials were the first to take tax money to hire a full-time school master. Now, the Old Deluder Satan Act of 1647, this is a pretty seminal law. It set down what became precedent that if your town or village had 50 or more families, you all had to work together to come up with some provision for instruction in reading and writing for the youth. Not formalized a certain number of hours or in a specific place, but that you did have some way on a regular basis of getting the children together to teach them basic reading and writing. Again, look at the name, Old Deluder Satan Act. You had to read and write just enough to keep the devil at bay. Once your village town grew into 100 households, then you officially had to create some kind of school. Now, a lot of times the church during the week, that building was used as the school, but still it was deemed the official school Monday through Friday. The number of hours of instruction, exactly what was going to be taught, specific curriculum, there was none of that. But they did have these foundational agreements that if you have this many households, you will have a school and you will teach reading and writing. And they brought in a little bit of math. These early American schools were, for the most part, funded and supported by the local families to come together and, again, secure the location and make sure there was at least some means, the horn books, a couple of slates with some chalk for the children to share. People who had money at this point, for the most part, weren't sending their kids to school. They were following the old European tradition of hiring tutors to come and stay in their homes and work with their children one-on-one or with the whole family. Oftentimes, a specialist would do one thing at a time for several months, all math, all English, all Latin. Uh, It was very much kind of made up as you go. So here's the question. Early in our country, was education considered a right of the individual Or was it a responsibility that was being laid on top of the citizens? Well, it depended who you asked. Schools at this time mostly served the sweet spot, if you will, of 5 to 13-year-olds, but you would find students between the ages of 3 and 21. The teachers lived with local families, ate with local families. The guidelines for their behavior were incredibly strict. Curriculum, it still was basic survival stuff reading, writing, and basic arithmetic. If the community could gather the extra funds, they would bring individuals in for short amounts of time to teach what they considered important. Latin, especially if the boys were going to go on to college, music, geometry, surveying, which was an incredibly important skill at the time, and elocution, again, for the potential of the boys to possibly go on to college. There was a great amount of peer teaching. There wasn't a breakout in grades. Remember, there wasn't much access to knowledge. Limited amount of books, limited amount of information. So once somebody was able to get their hands on a book and learn something, it was their responsibility to share it with the rest of the local youth. And then remember the timeline. 1790, the Constitution is ratified. And in the Constitution, there is basically no mention of education aside from the fact that, you know what, it's a state's right. This was one of the hottest arguments amongst the constitutional delegates. And indeed, when they were parsing out and negotiating, they agreed that education would be a state's right, not run by the federal government. That was a decision that to this very day still causes the push and pull. And we'll get there.
So as our young nation grows, when we start looking at the 1800s, we have to remember how fast the country as a whole is expanding. We've got states coming in almost every year, and we have the Louisiana Purchase, we get Alaska, the economy is shifting. Slavery is becoming an issue. The Oregon Trail, we've got people moving westward. Then we have the gold rush and we have the Civil War. In the midst of all of this change, we see the growth of common schools. Now, what is a common school? It is a place that is open to all children. It is publicly funded. This is the first time consistently that your average American child has the opportunity to gain knowledge, not just survival skills, not just the agricultural understanding, but to focus in on the kinds of things you might need for different kinds of trade jobs, different understandings of the world, politics, what's going on, how does our government work? These schools were registered with each state. But it wasn't so much to ensure quality of learning as it was to ensure that the state was able to keep track. How many children were there in the state? Were they in the school? It was more about some layer of control rather than quality of the educational experience. At the same time, we see the growth of private academies. Obviously, these were far more prevalent in big cities. Here is where we see the beginning of what we have in high school, multiple teachers, subject specialties, experts brought in, no state involvement in these private academies aside from very expensive charters. So the states liked private academies because they brought in a great deal of money that they could then turn around and use to fund teachers at all the public schools. So at this time, we, we see Horace Mann and Henry Barnard. Now, these are two names you will hear a lot as you study the history of education in America. And if you live on the East Coast or you travel to the East Coast, these are both names you'll see on an awful lot of buildings. These two gentlemen set down the guidelines for what a school needs to be. Like we had these common schools, but really what did the curriculum mean? Well, what they wanted to do was build upon the original laws. So indeed, if your township had 50 or more families, then you had to have the public school. And this was when teachers started first needing to be licensed by the individual states. There was the idea of standardizing methods and curricula. Not so much to ensure the best educational experience for the individuals, but to ensure that the same information was being taught. The focus was on the content, not on the individuals. It was all about delivery. Full-time state licensed administrators started being hired. These were men who were there to ensure that the individual teachers did not break their codes of conduct, it, again, wasn't so much about, are you a great teacher? Are you serving your students? It's, are you delivering what we tell you to deliver? And this is when we first start seeing grades broken out by age, first grade, third grade, fifth grade. Again, before this, it was pretty much the one room. It was pretty much peer teaching because they didn't have materials. With standardized methods and curricula, for the first time, there's the opportunity to get lots of materials, the same materials, out to children across the United States. In 1867, we have the creation of the Department of Education. Now remember, education from the very beginning of our country has been a state right, not a federal responsibility. So the Department of Education had no authority. It was a clearinghouse to try and ensure that what Henry Barnard and the Friends of Education were doing, that their materials, their methods, this was now a way to get that out to people on a broader scale and get information back how people were indeed using the materials. Now in 1871, something that may not initially sound like a big deal takes place, and it was huge. University of Michigan decides to start sending faculty out to inspect the schools. If a school passed the inspection, then their students, <clears throat> male students, 
Thank you very much. Didn't have to take an entrance exam to get in to the university. This was huge. Why? Oh, lots of reasons. Number one, it saved faculty a great deal of time. Well, okay, so what? It meant that tests to get into college were no longer given on an individual basis. So there was far greater opportunity for far more people to potentially get into the school, as opposed to writing a letter and begging an individual professor, will you give my son an exam? Now, if the school's passed, your son has the potential to go. It made the entrance so much more fair. Think about the people living out in the country what it took for them to first connect with an individual professor to give their son an exam, an entrance exam, the funds it took to get the child from the country into the city, the time it would take, would you have to pay for a hotel overnight? I mean, it was basically impossible. Suddenly, the possibility was real. But also, and this might even be the most key, it gave the perception across the nation when this became standard, that the whole point of staying in school, of going on and completing your education to get a diploma, it gave the impression that now it was all about getting yourself ready for university. So now we have more people able to go to college, more people thinking about college, but high schools across the nation were all over the place. We didn't have any standardization aside from well use these books. So the NEA organized a committee of 10 to help give ground rules. Now, again, education is a state's right. So these were guidelines, but these were guidelines that were taken very seriously. So this commission was convened to set out some parameters as guidelines. Think about who was on this committee. Six college presidents, the U.S. Commissioner of Education, two public high school principals, and one private school headmaster. All of these gentlemen had been educated in a traditional fashion from schools in the east of the United States, on the East Coast. What do you think they determined the purpose of high school in America to be? Here's the great irony of what the Committee of Ten stated. The secondary schools do not exist for the purposes of preparing boys and girls for college. Okay, that's what they specifically said. However, their primary conclusion was that the best preparation for life was basically a college prep curriculum anyway. So here's what they recommended. Remember, this is in the 1800s. The American education system should be eight years of elementary ed, four years of a secondary education, there should be few electives, not many. We want to keep them on a clean path. And all the courses should last the same number of minutes. They didn't say how many. They just said they should because then it's easier to keep track. Now, again, remember, 1893. Why these recommendations? Well, what were the gentlemen focusing on? Serving the economy and the society of that time where there was basically a set amount of information and knowledge to be imparted. The focus wasn't on creating new knowledge. It was on learning what existed. And what was most valued was the canon of literature and the mathematical concepts that had come over from England, and those served as the basis for what it meant to be educated. So college preparatory is the best preparatory for a full life. All right, so again, what does this look like in practice? Well, I'll tell you what it doesn't look like. It doesn't look like an education infused with art and music or physical education or vocational education. Why? Well, think about the economy in 1893. There was no need for art and music. There was no need for physical education. Any type of vocational education, that was your responsibility once you had enough reading and writing. Okay, again, and I know I'm repeating myself here, but it's very important to remember because if we don't know our past, we're going to repeat it. So 
1893, it was decided that a modern, relevant American curriculum was classical, college preparatory, devoid of respect for practical, hands-on, applied, grounded, on-the-job training or vocational educational subjects. Now, what's happening at the same time? This is when we start to see the growth of people who say, no, 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 no. College is not for everyone. We are a growing society. We need inventors. We need people who can go out and do and change and think independently, not just repeat the same canon of literature that's been studied for thousands of years. This is when John Dewey starts to make a name for himself, speaking out for the importance of school being more than a holding place where we separate those who have the potential to go to college and those who aren't worth our time with hands-on learning, meaningful learning, focusing on the experience of the learning for the individual learner. At the end of the 1800s, the Supreme Court makes a decision that is arguably one of the worst in its entire history, Plessy versus Ferguson. Now, the irony of this is that the case itself wasn't even about education. However, it laid down the rule of law that separate but equal was okay. This was used in education, particularly to do with funding. So whatever monies that the state had, they would funnel most of it into the white schools. Nice buildings, heat, more materials, chairs, desks, as opposed to the schools for African-American children, which were dilapidated, didn't have materials, teachers barely got paid, but the argument was made separate but equal. You have a building, we have a building. This was used not just against African-American children, but against any quote-unquote non-white children, including a 1927 case that forced a handful of Chinese children out of the one public school in a small town and force them to go to a private school because they didn't have the funds to build a separate school for the Chinese children, but they weren't allowed to go to the white school. This brings us to the end of movie one. In movie two, we will move from the early 1900s into the 1950s.